I believe that blind ambition a young person has is the best quality you possess. Really? That blind ambition of, I'm going to make it, I'm going to do it. There's this small gap and I'm going to fit it in there. Mm. That is the greatest gift because after a while, if you're in this business, you realize, aha, uh -huh, those illusions die. There are many illusions that disappear over the course of time. And to keep those ambitions alive for as long as possible is very, very nece necessary. Hi, Jack. How are you? Petra, darling. Fine and you. I'm fine, thank you. It's so lovely to talk to you. Yes, and uh, thank you for inviting me. Well, thank you for your time. It's, um, it's great about social media that we discover all these wonderful uh, uh, well, I discover all these wonderful artists on on social media. So that's um, but now we can meet on Zoom. But um, Jacques, tell me where are you at the moment? I am at my home in Waldenstein, or as the tourist guide brochure says, the picturesque little village of Waldenstein in the woodquarters of Austria, north of Vienna. Well, that's uh, so fortunate that you can be in such a beautiful um, place. And what, what was it about that specific place that attracted you to live there? Well, I used to live in big cities because uh, with the opera, you go there where the big theaters are. And, you know, in my heart, I'm still a Burschian because yeah. I, I want to live in the countryside to have this mm -hmm. peace and uh, the freedom and, of course, the privilege of going shopping in your pajamas, if you like, and nobody recognizes you. <laughs> that was very <laughs> attractive to move <laughs> into the countryside. And, uh, yes, when, I, when the uh, opportunity was there to buy uh, this beautiful villa, I said, let's do it. Mm -hmm. And I had sense. But now you are from South Africa. Yes. And uh, what what was the or how was your journey from South Africa? What how did your music education start in South Africa? Well, um, I sang a lot of choirs in a lot of choirs in primary school and in youth choirs and in high school and university choirs. So I already knew that I had a good voice. Mm -hmm. uh, so my, my music studies was mainly uh, focused on piano and clarinet. Um, my, that was my oh. head in, uh, mm -hmm. in high school. And uh, then I decided to go and study law at the Potschofstroom University for yeah. And uh, they, after a year, I, I wasn't happy. It wasn't, I mean, I, I went with so many illusions uh, concerning studying law. And I realized, listen, this is not uh, exactly the thing I would like to do for the next 40, 50 years of my life. And we were very lucky at, at Poch of Strum to have an excellent singing teacher, Professor Werner Nell. And uh, I got acquainted with him and he said to me, yeah, listen, if you need me to convince your father to study music, I think you have what it takes to have a career. And I said, okay, let's do it. And then after my uh, studies in South Africa, I left immediately for Europe because I had the privilege of uh, having family here. My mother's youngest sister is an artist, a painter in the Netherlands. And she said to me, sure, get yourself a tourist visit and uh, come and have a look what life is like and whether it will suit you. And I went with a three month tourist visit. Uh, one month later, I got my first audition and I was engaged wow. and I never left. <laughs> That's amazing. So it, it was so instant for you actually. To... I always feel ashamed when I, I tell how my career started. If you take it in comparison with the difficulties others have, I, <laughs> As I've said, one month, uh, and I, was, I wasn't even there on a working permit, I went for an audition, I got the job, and ever since I've been sitting in this roller coaster, uh, calling, experiencing my career. Well, that's amazing because, I mean, 
Um, as you know, in South Africa, there are no, not many opportunities for singers and, and a lot of singers uh, would love to, to be um, in, in Europe and, and have that experience. So, um, so I'm so happy for you that that happened for you like that. Yeah, but, you, but, but it also comes with the talent and, and of course, grabbing the opportunities. Of course, you you have to be willing to start at the bottom and uh, have a lot of ambition. And uh, you must have a sense of brutal honesty with yourself. Uh, what am I lacking? What are my fortes? What are my weaknesses? And how do I uh, build that into an attractive product for this multi-billion euro opera business in Europe? And uh, I had, of course, a lot of luck. I, I think I have more luck than most people on earth. Mm. Uh, so I took it with a lot of gratitude and I gathered, if I grabbed every opportunity I could to learn. Because as you've said, in South Africa, we what, what do we know about opera in South Africa? We see it on a DVD at the most. And if you see it at a theater, I mean, where I studied in Port Strum, you still had to drive two hours to Johannesburg or three hours to Pretoria to go and watch an opera. So uh, I had to learn. That was the thing that was very clear to me. Uh, and I took the old school route. I said yes to the first engagement I got through the touring, the national touring opera of the Netherlands. And then I got engaged in a theater in East Germany, mining, and it's a very traditional opera house. And there I learned the ropes. I, mm -hmm. learned, I learned the business. I learned how to be a singer, how to survive this business for now for the last 20 years. So in that sense, uh, I am glad that was my uh, mindset towards starting this career, being a student, a lifelong student of the business. Do you think that because you know um, you come from that uh, place in South Africa where you know it's so difficult to, to get uh, uh, or to, to do have a career in the music industry that you um, sort of uh, was grateful for every opportunity you got here? You know, do you think that changed because you came with that mindset? Oh, absolutely. Um, after my engagement in the Netherlands, uh, there was, of course, a period where I was looking for my next job. Yeah. And uh, they were doing at the World Youth Opera in Germany, La Cenerentola, Cinderella by Rossini. And uh, one of my colleagues that was also engaged in the Netherlands, she said she told me that her singing teacher is the vocal coach of this opera production. Am I willing to go and sing in the choir? And I said, yes, yeah, sure. I mean, I'm here in Europe. Uh, if I get a little money and I can live, I will do it. Mm -hmm. Then three days later, that same teacher phones me. She doesn't know me at all. And she said to me, yeah, Jacques, uh, I don't know why, but I have a strange feeling you are better than an opera chorus singer. Uh, would you like to come and audition for The Prince? The role, the, the main male role in the opera. Now, first of all, I was uh, speechless uh, because yeah. this woman doesn't know me. Um, I'm fresh from the boat. Uh, she's taking a big risk on me. And I said, well, I have nothing to lose. Sure, I will be coming to Germany then. And I sang the audition and plum, 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 I sang the premiere of uh, that opera. And since then, my career just took off. Wow. So just because I was willing to start at the bottom, I was willing to sing in the choir. Mm -hmm. And I, I think in many aspects of, of my career, uh, this willingness to be the least yeah. has paid immensely. Mm. Well, this is, this is very good advice for any young singer, uh, especially in this time, isn't it? Because I, I was, uh, you know, I ask all the artists as well, what is your advice for young singers or what is for young musicians? And, and would this be your advice? 
Yes. Um, don't come to Europe and think they need you. Don't uh, think for one second the opera world is poorer off because they don't have you. Yeah. You are stepping in a centuries-old system. It's traditional. It has a lot of unwritten rules. And uh, as you know, living in Vienna, unemployed musicians are everywhere. I mean, I think there's over 5,000 unemployed opera singers just in Vienna alone. Mm -hmm. So if you come from a country like South Africa, you have to give them something special, some je ne sais quoi, to say, aha, this, this person is interesting. There's a place for him or her in the opera business. But mm -hmm. don't come and the opera needs you. Because mm -hmm. that's a... Mm -hmm. Also, I also, the thing I... I I don't really give advice to young singers because I believe that blind ambition a young person has is the best quality you possess. Really? That blind ambition of, I'm going to make it, I'm going to do it. There's this small gap and I'm going to fit it in there. Mm. That is the greatest gift because after a while, if you're in this business, you realize, aha, uh -huh, those illusions die. There are many illusions that disappear over the course of time. And to keep those ambitions alive for as long as possible is very, very nece necessary. It's almost that naivety, you know, that I think that I believe some people have, and that makes them attempt things that other people would think, oh no, I shouldn't, yeah. I knew then what I know now about the business. Oh my God, I would have, I would have been scared Ship this. So, <laughs> in that sense, uh, being yeah. uh, blind with ambition, being inexperienced, full of illusions, living in a delusional world, yeah. it's, it's, your, it's your secret weapon. Yeah. No, I'm yeah. with you on that one. I also think living in the clouds makes so so much better. You yeah. have to for the stars and uh, just go for it. Yeah. Now, listen, your your parents, you said that you had to speak to your parents because, I mean, um, studying law compared to studying music, it's uh, law uh, it would have been a much more safer option, I would think. So and for a South African um, family, you know, education is so important. So what did your p parents think of your decision? <laughs> Well, <clears throat> there was a little war. <laughs> uh, of course, it wasn't just like, uh, okay, then you go and study opera. I mean, my yeah. father is a very successful businessman. So mm -hmm. it's black uh, on white. And uh, to go and tell him, listen, I want to go into this multi-technicolor filled world, all based on gray, wasn't uh, that easy a convincement. Other, but uh my father as as i think as difficult as it was for him i commend him for allowing me to reach for my dream to go for the dream and i uh, if i can give advice to any parent out there rather support your child in their passion than trying to support them becoming something they're not happy in because yeah. if you have passion for something, you will make a success out of it. Yeah, and, uh, and for that, I commend my parents that they allowed me. And yes, it paid off. So in, in your um, career so far, um, are, are there roles that you particularly wanted to sing that you uh, had the opportunity to sing? I have been very blessed in, in that sense. From my first engagement right through, I've only sang the lead roles. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, uh, every role was also a bit of a schooling. You, you take from a role, you take experience, you take technical abilities, you take artistry with it. And uh, the, the thing I only guided was the things I said no to. I said a, load, a lot more no to roles than I said yes. 
because and for uh, what reason? Yeah, because you know, if you ha are a singer, you want to sing until the day you retire. If you sing too big things too early, you can ruin the instrument. And also, each role needs a certain amount of life experience to make it convincible. And if you're lacking that life experience, that role is half baked. It means uh, you're only making a joke of yourself. And uh, you have to be honest, as I've said in the beginning, you must be critical to yourself and say, listen, this is a fantastic role, but I don't have the life experience yet to portray that character. And uh, I started my career as a very high tenor, a Rossini tenor, you know, top C's, top C's and a lot of runs. And uh, as I became older, of course, the body changes and uh, the voice also changes. And your mentality changes and your life experience plays a huge role in that sound productivity. And uh, it's only now in the last five, six years that I've really turned to the heroic roles because I made a Fachweg, so I was a full lyrical tenor when I was young and now I'm doing the heroic uh, roles. And I'm grateful that I waited up until now to say, yes, let's do it. Now is the perfect time to study it. And it has paid off. And was it a difficult transition? Oh. It is well, um, of course, life has thrown me with its fair share of lemons. Yeah. Uh, in 2018, I was diagnosed with stage three lymphatic cancer. And it took 20 months of my life to battle that through chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. And during that period in my life, I uh, said, listen, with this sickness, a lot of things get perspective in your life. And uh, I then decided to make a total new schooling of the voice. I got a fantastic singing professor in Vienna, Irina Gavrilovici, and mm -hmm. she's from the Italian opera school. And uh, I said to her, listen, my voice is changing. Now, she actually had heard me years before already because uh, I sang everywhere as a lyrical tenor. And she said, yes, I know your voice well. And I have already then thought you were going to become a more dramatic singer. So, yes, I will help you. And then I took lessons from her for a year. And then I started selling myself as a hero heroic tenor. And uh, with great success, I am now very much in demand. Thank God. Wonderful. And yeah. It was it's a big challenge. It is a it is a it is a big thing to change your voice because it's the voice is such a personal thing. Mm -hmm. You know, if you say to someone you have an ugly voice, it is a very very personal insult. So yeah. uh, working with that voice and building a voice into a new direction, it is it's a responsibility. Mm -hmm. And I'm very I thank God I met this lady. And uh, we understand each other also because I'm not a I'm not a person that uh, uh, how, how do you say it in good English whack around the bush. Okay. I like to take things on heads first, and yeah. my experiences with singing teachers were like that. I mean, I've never had a singing teacher who gives me a foot massage and sends me home. I mean, mm -hmm. they put me into uh, what I have to be, and I like that because. Mm -hmm. Uh, as Renata Tabaldi said, many singers have been ruined by a compliment and not many singers have been saved by a critic. So you have to be open to that criticism and say, okay, listen, I put myself in your hands. Let's do this. And I haven't looked back. I, I visit her frequently. I take singing lessons. Uh, I see it as a a sort of download of software, if you like, to go to her and just download again uh, the newest uh, developments and uh, technical things. And uh, yes, it works for me. Well, over the, the time of the pandemic, um, I've spoken to many, actually to many students, and I've 
And I've really noticed how important in an artist's life the teacher or the coach is. And uh, did you have this support also uh, over the lockdown time that you had support with, from co your coaches? Uh, yes, uh, I am fortunate to be a, a Bavarian state artist. That meant through the corona pandemic, I have still received a full salary. So okay. uh, in that sense, I'm, I was really blessed. And I could continue my normal studies and working with my coaches. And uh, yes, I, I can just say I'm thankful and grateful for, for having this reality in my life. Uh, but yes, I, I too have suffered from the corona pandemic, concerts being cancelled, productions being cancelled, uh, not feeling uh, relevant to the economic system or to the political landscape. Uh, as an artist, you are you're a little bit caught in limbo. You're mm -hmm. not irrelevant, but you're not relevant. And uh, that is quite a harsh thing on the human mentality to say, uh, okay, this is my position in life. I'm not hungry. I'm happy. I'm healthy. I um, still have my engagements that will come in the future. And uh, just staying calm. You know, as my great friend, Professor Martin Watt, who's a composer in Cape Town, always says, the calmest thing is to stay important. So, oh. <laughs> that's, that's my but but it's true what you're saying because I think it's this. Uh, uh, you know, I've I've asked many artists uh, about the value of art if they feel valued, and and we spoke about that over the lockdown time. Um, but it's really true what you're saying, because it's almost like you have to apologize for feeling um, that art is important because then you, you, you know, they always compare it like, well, you know, a medical profession is in this time most important, but it's also then for emotional well-being from people that we need art because everybody tapped into art uh, during the lockdown times. And I mean, not everybody um, you know, had to have medical help, but but if it wasn't for the fact that we could switch on a television or listen to music or or read or you know that that I think what would have life been then? So it's true what you're saying. It was it's that. Mm. Because I think this pandemic it came clear the role that theater plays within a society. You know, a theater, I call it the lounge of a city. It's the lounge of society. Yeah. Two neighbors of different ethnical, religious, uh, gender backgrounds can sit next to each other, experience the same emotions, experience the same humor. And it becomes clear that me and my neighbor who do not, we don't speak every day, but we have the same fears. We have the same humor. We have the same emotions. And this is the wonderful thing about theater. It gives you perspective of your place within society. And uh, it baffles me that uh, polit politicians try to, to damp that reality within society. I mean, nobody can give as a... Uh, harmless critic or satire to the, the government as a comedian or an artist on stage because you yeah. can get away with murder. You can say yeah. how it, everybody can laugh about it. Yeah. You take it all joke, but there's many uh, truths in a jest. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I think through the pandemic, theatre has really finally reached that point where we realise what it is to have live theatre. And sure, I'm, I'm, many people make videos and uh, online things, which is great. But theater is life, you know, yeah. theater, it's life. Mm -hmm. It's, if you take that onto a video, it's, it's an art form you, you capture in amber. It's still, it's beautiful to look at, but it's dead inside. And yeah. theater is really, it's life. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's not, have you seen the DVD of La Traviata? It's, were you there that evening when the Sopranos wig caught fire? You yeah. know, that, yeah. that's what theater is about. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And here in Europe, I, n- I know many people who go to the theater every night. They don't have a television. They go to the theater. And good on them. Yeah. Because it, it, it really gives you a sense of your place in society. And uh, besides that, it makes people happy. It makes people yeah. happy. Yeah. And every every artist I spoke to during that time talked about the energy that they got from the audience, but the audience also got the energy from the artists, you know. Yes. So, so I think that's also that. I think these things uh, were now realized that maybe were just taken for granted always, but now suddenly it was like I speak to a ballet dancer and they talk about online, these these streamings, uh, online streamings, and then they said, but you get on stage and then you, you don't sense there's no audience. You, you, you cannot, it's not the same, you know, it's almost as if you bounce off each other. Yes, and it's, uh, for instance, last year uh, in October, I recorded uh, a DVD or a, a recording of the Winterreise, uh, with a ballet uh, of, of Augsburg uh, in the new uh, Hans Zender orchestration. Fantastic work. And also the, the choreographer, Ricardo Fernando, made such a beautiful telling of this uh, mental state of this wanderer within this fantasy world uh, portrayed by dancers. And we couldn't have a live audience. There, it was uh, we played for ourselves on stage. It was caught on camera and it was broadcasted. But still, that evening, at the end, when we bowed, there was no applause. We bowed in silence, and it was such a strong grasp of the human emotion. Uh, these artists who just performed ninety minutes live, and then they bow into silence. The audience's role in a performance yeah. is just as strong as that what comes from the other side of the curtain. And it becomes very clear now what role theatre, live theatre, has in our lives. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I totally agree. And, and like you said, it's that, that realisation now that we have um, of the importance of it. I think in our society. What is your what is your opinion about the education um, uh, where young children get more opportunity to take part in art or to to have the opportunity? So invaluable mm-hmm. because art has to take responsibility for their public of tomorrow. Mm-hmm. You want a theatre to survive, you need your audience to survive. So, of course, you have to give children and young people that uh, possibility to experience theatre, music, ballet, acting, uh, because not all of them come from houses which are filled with uh, the love of theatre or uh, opera or uh, musicals. Uh, it is, it's a part of life that's totally shut off to them. And I believe every educational uh, institution should give that type of experience to to a young person and say, listen, there's also this part of life that can interest you. There's also this part of life that is important for your mental development. I mean, if you take, if we go back to the ancient Greeks, music was one of, the ground foundations within the human education together with maths and science and languages. But today music falls almost totally away. Yeah. And uh, music has, it, it has such potential in the development of young people. Music teaches you to have a long-term goal. Music teaches you to work towards something and not receiving the results immediately. And uh, we live now in a society where people want it now. I want the result now. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, a a result that comes now doesn't last long. Yeah. The happiness that doesn't last that long because then 
very shortly after that, you're bored. And then you're on to the next thing you want now. But music, ballet, uh, the arts, it, it's, it teaches you to search for happiness over a long period of your life. And uh, yeah, it's a pity. It's a pity that uh, we are caught in society now with my telephone is two years old and I throw it away and then I get a new one, even though the last one works perfectly. Yeah. Uh, it's, it, it goes through in every aspect of our lives. Mm. Music and yeah, art, it, it forces you to break, break, uh, work on a little step for now. Next year, we'll work on another step. Have patience. And I think also it teaches you to to hope and dream for the future. Because I think just like you, in every artist, this is what I was thinking um, during the time I did this project where I photographed the artists in the windows, that they all must have had this dream sometime in their lives to think, I want to be a concert pianist or I want to be a singer. And this dream has come true. So... So this is just proof that dreams come true. You just have to look at an artist to, to see the evidence, you know, that dreams come true. Dreams come true. And I always say, to, uh, without the dream, yeah. what, where, where's your goal? Mm. I mean, goal is to get you closer to the realize, uh, reality of that dream. Mm. Uh, the thing I find that is always the biggest struggle for people is the discipline that goes with it. If you decide to become an artist, you have to fall in love with critique. And you have to have patience and a lot of discipline. If you don't have those aspects, move on. Go and play cricket, go and play rugby. Ten years of your life, it's done with. But yeah is to uh, reach for a, a professional state of, of being an artist. Mm -hmm. You have to be crucially honest with yourself, brutally. You have to be open to critique. You have to hunger for critique. Because it's only through critique that you can better yourself. Sure, you also take the critique from whom it comes. Yeah. Some, some you just push away. But you have to be thirsty for critique in your mm -hmm. life. Because that's the only way that you will stay interesting. That's a very good, um, that's good advice. That's really. Not easy. Mm. Nobody yeah. likes to be criticized. But mm. uh, it is the one thing that polishes you. Mm. But now, Jock, uh, tell me, uh, what is your wish for the future? Oh. I would like to have a handicap 10 in golf. <laughs> I'd like to spend at least two months every year on my yacht in the Mediterranean. Yeah. <laughs> spend lots of time with my dogs. <laughs> <laughs> so how many dogs do you have? I have two dogs, two French bulldogs. Yeah. I call them my um, <laughs> ice farker. My uh, okay. <laughs> our pigs, because they, oh, I love them to bits. They, they mm -hmm. only love, 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 love. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have two cats. Oh, okay. And, and of course, here in the forest, we wake up every morning with a new animal visitor in the garden. So yeah. uh, that sense, uh, it's paradise. Yeah. And how does the dogs and cats get along? Uh, well, we had a little bit of a, 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 a drama a few months ago. Um, mm. The little female uh, uh, the bulldog, I, her name is Molly. Yeah. Well, quite a little bit special. I think she has a little bit of sort of a Down syndrome thing going as a dog. Mm. She doesn't really listen to anything. She does her own thing the whole time. And her favorite uh, part-time activity is to drag the cat up the stairs uh, by its tail oh. so yes and then after many months <laughs> the cat finally decided i've had now enough of you and she <laughs> in her eye and she lost her eye yes 
recognize her losing an eye. I mean, she's just as wild and bewildered as, as ever. Yeah. And she's dragging the cat by the <laughs> tail off the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> but actually they love each other when we are in front of the television or somewhere laying they always lay together and oh that's that, so sweet yeah the cats, the cats lick her and uh, also duka the the little boy french bulldog now we are quite a happy petting zoo family <laughs> that sounds wonderful so they are in your wish as well for the future yeah, i yeah. i Animals. I would rather much rather spend my free time with animals than with people. <laughs> <laughs> Even though they scratch each other's eyes out. As long as they scratch each other's eyes out, everything is fine. <laughs> <laughs> But now, listen, before we go, I have to ask you, I, I know, you know, we, we talked about the arts and the difficulties of the arts, but then there's also the businesses and, um, and restaurants here in Vienna and, and all over the world. Do you have a favorite place where you go for coffee or a restaurant that you can do a shout out and, and just mention them? Uh, in Vienna, yeah. I, it's, uh, next to the Volksoper in the ninth yeah. bit here, there's a modern Korean restaurant. Yeah. Best Korean food you can imagine. Really? And whenever I'm in Vienna, I go for lunch at that restaurant. And they know me also very well. And I shout out <laughs> to modern Korea. <laughs> in the the ninth year what is of the year. name? Modern is the, Korea. Modern Korea. Okay. I'll put the link in the description. Yes, they are excellent. Okay. Oh, that's wonderful. But um, Jacques, it was now so lovely to talk to you. Yes, likewise. And uh, I hope all your wishes come true and, and that maybe you'll invite me on your yacht one day. <laughs> it's a date. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Have a wonderful afternoon. Yes, and you Thank too. You. Thank you.